This week on ANN, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit rules in favor of former employees of Kellogg USA. The two lost their jobs when they were assessed of missing too many shifts due to their Sabbath observance. As immigration policy takes center stage in the United States, the church's North American territory issues a statement emphasizing the importance of equality for all. And another Sabbath observance case is tried, this time in the Philippine Supreme Court. The landmark decision helps raise awareness of the Seventh-day Sabbath in the nation. These stories and more coming up. Thanks so much for joining us this week. First in the news, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit issued a decision in favor of former employees of Kellogg USA who were fired due to their Sabbath observance. Richard Taburo and Guadalupe Diaz were terminated in 2012 for violating the company's policy mandating work on Saturdays. The plaintiffs later sued Kellogg for religious discrimination. They claim the company did not provide the religious accommodations mandated under Title VII. In 2011, Kellogg increased production and implemented a new work scheduling program known as Continuous Crewing. The program created four separate rotating shifts in which employees were to work approximately two Saturdays a month or 26 Saturdays a year. Tabura and Diaz used paid days off and swapped shifts with other employees to meet the criteria. However, due to their Sabbath observance, they had too many absence points within a 12-month period. And they were terminated after what Kellogg described as progressive discipline measures were exhausted. In its ruling on January 17th, the Tenth Circuit said in order for an accommodation to be reasonable, Kellogg would have provided employees the opportunity to avoid working on all Saturdays, and not just some. Todd McFarlane is an associate general counsel for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In response to the ruling, he said, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is pleased with this watershed decision upholding the critically important right of Americans to adhere to their religious beliefs in the workplace. And visit news.adventist.org to read more about the decision. As lawmakers of the United States debate ways to address undocumented immigrants, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in North America emphasized the importance of equality for all Americans. In a written statement, leaders focused on the dangers of discrimination and how it has no backing by the Bible. It says, as the most ethnically diverse Christian denomination in the U.S., the Seventh-day Adventist Church proudly defends the rights of all men, women, and children, no matter their country of origin. The equal rights afforded in the United States Constitution and fair treatment as immigrants and refugees in our beloved country. It goes on to say the Seventh-day Adventist Church joins other communities of faith in prayerfully calling for all Americans to search their hearts and seek God's guidance in their daily interactions with others. God creates all his creatures equal, and his love is available to all who accept it, no matter their background, place of birth, or economic status. If God is for us, who can be against us? Visit news.adventist.org to read the full statement. The Supreme Court of the Philippines recently ruled in favor of an Adventist medical school student. Denmark Valmoris filed the lawsuit against Mindanao State University College of Medicine, Dean Cristina Akakoso, and faculty member Giovanni Cabildo. The filing was made after Valmoris' request for exemption from classwork and exams that fell on Saturdays were continuously denied. According to Valmora's attorneys, the refusal was a non-compliance with Section 5 of the Bill of Rights of the 1987 Philippine Constitution. Section 5 states that the free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship without discrimination or preference shall forever be allowed. While the ruling was made in July, what's been called a landmark decision was recently made public. One of his attorneys, Neil Abayan, said the ruling helped solidify the identity of Adventists. He said... The Valmores case can be classified as a landmark case due to it being the first case questioning the Sabbath-keeping faith of Seventh-day Adventists. Thus, it will most likely be discussed in law schools under the Constitutional Law 2 subject. So, in effect, the next generation of lawyers will be made aware of what Sabbath-keeping is about. The president of the Adventist Development and Relief Agency this week spoke at the United Nations on the uniqueness of faith-based organizations when responding to humanitarian needs. Jonathan Duffy was invited to speak at the UN's fourth annual symposium on the role of religion and faith-based organizations in international affairs. He contributed to the symposium session that covered development, humanitarian, and human rights perspectives. During his comments, he highlighted the unique advantages faith-based non-governmental organizations, or NGOs, have over NGOs that are not associated with a religious group. 
According to Duffy, 85% of the world's population has an association with a religious organization or faith groups. He said when disasters strike, people tend to seek shelter in houses of worship. With this in mind, faith-based organizations have a stronger connection to local actors who interact with internally displaced persons. They also work closely with organizations that provide aid in countries that host refugees. Duffy also noted that while faith-based organizations are experts in service delivery, where they lack is with their influence over global policy. So if we look at it, the strongest part of civil society is often faith-based organizations. And they are the ones that have the opportunities to influence people, whether it's through the messages that come through churches or synagogues or mosques or temples or, 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 or other um, religious places of worship that they can actually impact society and lead society in certain decision-making. So in working as a faith-based organization, the uniqueness that we have is a close connection with local actors. The government of Paraguay called upon the Adventist Development and Relief Agency to spearhead relief efforts in wake of last week's torrential rainstorm. Paraguay's National Emergency Secretariat, or SEN, requested the agency to address the needs of residents in Asuncion the nation's capital city. The increased water levels of the Paraguay River, which borders the city, forced more than 1,500 people from their homes. However, SEN has estimated that 3,500 residents have been affected. ADRA Paraguay, in response, delivered metal sheets to repair rooftops to allow families to repair their homes. The ADRA humanitarians have also visited numerous shelters where affected families are temporarily living. In doing so, they are assessing how to address the residents' most urgent needs. Coming up, hundreds of Congolese refugee students in Rwanda complete their vocational training through a program developed by Adventist Humanitarians. But up next, Adventist Youth Ministries has a new associate director who will oversee churches, pathfinders, and adventurers ministries. Maybe you've seen this before. This is sometimes taught to children when they're learning about how to have a relationship with God. It goes something like this. Here's the church, here's the steeple. Open the doors and there's all the people. But I actually think this isn't quite right. I like to do it more this way. Here's the building, here's the steeple. Open the doors and there's the church. Sometimes I think we get the church confused with a building. But the church is not a building. The church is a people a people who are in relationship with Christ through the Holy Spirit, who are growing in a relationship with God. You see, the church is a people who are at all kinds of different stages in their love and trust relationship with God. There are people in process. Some are further ahead, if you will, in their trusting relationship with God, and some are just beginning and some are in between. But nevertheless, there are people in process together with God, each other, and the world around them. Interestingly enough, the church, the people of God, are also the means of telling about His love to the world. Who else better but people who have experienced His love and forgiveness in their life? You see, the church is not the building, it's the people. May I work in with you, young fella? That's the way you do it. Gotta put a little weight on it. But I'll put it back up here for you. Welcome back. Church leaders this week officially voted Andreas Peralta to serve as the new Associate Director of Adventist Youth Ministries. Peralta is coming from his role as Youth Director for the Church's Atlantic region, which includes six states and the island of Bermuda. He is the youngest to have that role within the Church's North American territory. Yeah, Peralta is a native of the Dominican Republic. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Theology from the Antillian Adventist University in Puerto Rico. After completing his studies at Antillian, he enrolled at Andrews University, where he earned his Master of Divinity. He also earned his Doctor of Ministry degree from Andrews University in Teamwork and Urban Youth Ministry. And in addition to serving the church as an ordained pastor, he is also a United States Navy Lieutenant Reserve Chaplain. 
Peralta is passionate about empowering youth, children, and young adults in order to grow in Christ and to look to Jesus as their ultimate example. He has mobilized thousands of youth to serve in hundreds of community projects and dozens of mission trips locally and internationally. He and his wife of 16 years, Martha, have a daughter named Melanie. As Associate Director, Peralta will oversee the church's junior youth ministries, which include Pathfinders and Adventurers programs. Hello Adventurers, Pathfinders, and Master Guides. My name is Pastor Andres Peralta, the new Associate Youth Director of Pathfinder Ministry of the World Church. It is truly a blessing to be part of this wonderful team with Pastor Gary and Pastor Paco. I thank God for the privilege of serving you. By the grace of God, I am praying for continued guidance as we work together in this ministry. As faithful servant of God, let us continue to be a friend to men. Let us take the Advent message to the whole world in this generation. Remember, we are Pathfinder Strong. Let us share the truth that will set us free. God bless you. In Rwanda, 350 refugee youth successfully completed the requirements for vocational trades through a program conducted by Adventist Humanitarians. The graduation ceremony on January 12 culminated the 45-day training at Gitway Adventist College. All of the students are originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. The students are currently living among four of the nation's refugee camps. The program was organized by the Adventist Development and Relief Agency's Rwanda branch. It was also developed by another Adventist ministry named Impact Hope. Students chose one of the following trades for their training. Hair styling, tailoring, electricity insta installation, domestic manufacturing, plumbing, and permaculture. Government and church leaders also attended the graduation ceremony. The nation's Minister of Disaster Management and Refugees, the Honorable de Montreux Jean Doc, emphasized how the training will empower their development. He said, I would like to remind you that the technical skills are a foundation of self-reliance, financial independence, and social welfare. Start from the acquired skills to develop durable solutions for you and refugees in general. The Ministry of Disaster Management and Refugees of Rwanda partners with organizations to provide educational opportunities for refugees living in the nation. So far, the partnerships have helped more than 160,000 refugees gain skills to help them secure employment. A great need for Adventist radio broadcasting in Majuro Marshall Islands has been met with the opening of a new station. Nearly 28,000 residents of Majuro can now set their dials to Joy 90.7 FM to enjoy daily Adventist programming. The station's two radio antennas sit on the campuses of Majuro Seventh-day Adventist School and Church and the Laura Seventh-day Adventist Church and School. Joy FM is a ministry operated by the churches Guam and Micronesia Territory. The church's message has been broadcasted throughout Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands over the past 27 years. Adventist World Radio and the church's North American Territory also contributed to the station's funding. Two Majuro Bible workers have received training from the chief engineer of Adventist World Radio in Guam. The workers will operate the 300-watt transmitter and will continue to train others to ensure the broadcast runs 24 hours a day. Joy FM has equipped the Majuro station with a year's worth of programming, including Bible studies and music. As the station's operators gain more experience, they hope to produce content that's catered specifically for local communities. The church's Guam Micronesia region also operates two additional stations. Plans are in place to construct three more stations throughout the Micronesia Islands. An Adventist-operated hospital became the first in the U.S. state of Maryland to earn the National Safe Sleep Hospital Certification. Adventist Healthcare Washington Adventist Hospital was recognized at the bronze level for its commitment to encouraging safe sleep practice for infants. Washington Adventist Hospital was able to earn the certification by meeting three key criteria recommended by American Academy of Pediatrics. They include developing a safe sleep policy and providing training on infant safe sleep to all mother baby unit staff members. And the final criteria was providing infant safe sleep education to all parents of infants. The Director for Women's Services at Washington Adventist Hospital, Michelle Schwarzman, spoke on what the recognition means for patients. She said, this certification lets parents know that our hospital is committed to helping them create a safe sleep environment for their baby 
both in the hospital and when they return home. Further, it demonstrates our caregivers' ongoing commitment to patient safety and high quality care. Coming up, get safety tips from Adventist Risk Management on Facebook and Twitter. But up next, this 16-year-old barely had any money, but she saved what she could and walked 28 miles without shoes to purchase her own Bible. Learn her story right after this. It was around noon when Peter went up to the roof to pray. It was here that Peter had a vision about a large sheet containing a mix of unclean animals, representing God's affirmation of the diversity of peoples in the growing church. We had heard that Peter was staying at the house of Simon the Tanner and were instructed by Cornelius the Centurion to go out and find him. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Holy Spirit told him to go downstairs because three men were looking for him. Peter went down and told the men that he was the one they were looking for. We then told Peter that Cornelius the centurion had been told by an angel that Peter would come and see him at his house. So, unbeknown to Peter, Cornelius was already expecting his visit to Caesarea. What happened here was quite unusual, just the fact that Peter entered the house. Remember that it was against the law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. Cornelius told Peter how three days earlier he had been praying in his house when an angel had appeared before him. Peter shared with Cornelius his new understanding that God does not show favoritism and is the Lord of all. This was a real turning point. From this point on, the gospel was also given among other people groups, and it all started out with prayer and fasting and a vision. Welcome back. If for Wales, why not for the kingdom? And if for the kingdom, why not for the world? Learn about the teenager who inspired faith leaders in Wales to fall in love with the Bible and to promote a biblically inspired life. Learn more in this week's episode of Lineage called Mary Jones and World Mission. In the year 1800, a 16-year-old Welsh girl longed to own her own Bible. She'd been saving up her pennies from the age of 10, and finally she had enough to buy her own Bible. Mary was from a poor family, and there were many other things she could have spent her money on, such as a pair of shoes, but she really wanted a Bible in her own language. The problem was, though, the nearest one was 28 miles away. And undeterred by the distance and her lack of shoes, she set off from her home right here and walked through the valleys to the town of Bala. Arriving here in the town of Bala, she went to the home of Reverend Thomas Charles. Today, his home stands on the high street and has now been converted into a bank. He was so inspired by her story that he sold her three Bibles for the price of one. One of those today is in the National Library in Wales, and another one is at Cambridge University's library. The story of Mary Jones inspired many others. Reverend Joseph Hughes asked a daring question of church leaders soon after. If for Wales, why not for the kingdom? And if for the kingdom, why not for the world? That question posed at a meeting of the Religious Tract Society on the 7th of December, 1802, would reverberate around Wales and ultimately the world.
captured by the vision of the Bible being readily available in the language of the people, William Wilberforce and other members of the Clapham sect sprang into action. They made this vision part of their campaign to make goodness fashionable in the hope that people would fall in love with the Bible and a biblically inspired way of life. At a meeting on the 7th of March, 1804, of around 300 people in the London Tavern, which used to stand near here on Bishopsgate, William Wilberforce and the campaigning groups he was a part of formed the British and Foreign Bible Society, now known as the Bible Society. In the last 200 years, they have gone into over 200 different countries with God's Word. Soon after this society was formed, in 1816, the American Bible Society was formed in New York City. Later in the 19th century, inspired by Hudson Taylor and the China Inland Mission, seven students at Cambridge University, later known as the Cambridge Seven, gave up promising careers and sailed to China to be missionaries. Their influence inspired many others, causing the number of missionaries in China to swell from 165 in 1885 to 800 just 15 years later, approximately one-third of the Protestant missionary force. The Keswick Convention also had a profound impact on mission service, inspiring many people to devote their lives to the service of God in faraway lands. As the dark ages came to a close and the light of God's word was beginning to shine, Daniel 12 verse 4 was being fulfilled. The 1260-year prophecy, which came to a close in 1798, coincided with the words of Daniel, who said that many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. This referred to knowledge of the Bible, which would only increase as people had access to it, a cause that countless missionaries devoted their lives to. Today, mission service may not be as cutting edge as it was back then, or the Bible as new, but the need for both is still vital. The Great Commission still applies today. There are countless people who have never heard of the Bible and who have no idea what Christianity is. Maybe God is calling you to be a missionary, to leave your home, your place of comfort, and fly away to a different land and be a missionary for God there where people have not heard of Him yet. May we treasure God's word as did Mary Jones and may we go wherever God calls us. We're drawing to close with the Lineage series. In fact, next week's episode is the finale of season one. Production for the second season is already underway, but if you want to stay connected with the series, visit lineagejourney.com. The slogan for the insurance company of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is, our ministry is to protect your ministry. Amen. And with that in mind, Adventist Risk Management has prepared a series of videos that share practical methods for safeguarding your church, school, or other Adventist institutions. Emily Mastrapa has more. Sometimes the best way to explain safety and risk management is through visual demonstrations. Adventist Risk Management provides a variety of video resources to answer questions, explain difficult concepts, and to highlight the importance of keeping your members and ministries safe. Adventist Risk Management is the official insurance and risk management company of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Their goal is to serve the church's ministries by not only providing insurance, but risk management services as well. On their website, they provide important information in the form of webinars and videos. They have videos on risk resources and webinars on conferences and education, and also on safety. They have over 40 videos to help you learn more about risk management and safety. Visit AdventistRisk.org to find these videos, along with newsletters and initiatives. 
You can find them at, on Facebook at Adventist Risk, where you can sign up to receive a weekly newsletter. You can also follow them on Twitter at Adventist Risk. Adventist Risk Management is here to help you find solutions that will minimize your risks. Be sure to have a look at their resources. And finally for today's program, let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week we'll focus on the second extension of the LNG White Estate. Then we'll learn about an Adventist hospital in Ethiopia that was recognized by the nation's emperor. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On January 21, 1976, a new Ellen G. White Seventh-day Adventist Research Center was dedicated at Loma Linda University. Located in the University Library, this was only the second Ellen White Research Center to be established, the first having been set up at Newbold College two years earlier. But in 1985, the Loma Linda Center became just the second Ellen G. White Estate branch office following the estate's headquarters at the General Conference and the original branch of office at Andrews University. This photograph of the 1976 dedication shows General Conference President Robert H. Pearson in the center with, to the right, the then Loma Linda University President Norskov Olson and University Library Director George Summers, and to the left, the then Ellen White Estate Secretary Arthur White, while at the far left is Jim Nix, the chairman of the Loma Linda University Department of Archives and Special Collections, who today is the current director of the Ellen G. White Estate. On January 26, 1971, the new building for the Empress Zaudito Memorial Adventist Hospital in Addis Ababa, the capital city of Ethiopia, was officially opened by Emperor Haile Selassie. The hospital had begun operating in the Ethiopian capital in 1932 after Haile Selassie requested an Adventist doctor, George Bergman, to begin medical work for his country's people. After fascist Italy conquered Ethiopia in 1936, the Italian colonial authorities took over the hospital for three years. But after the restoration of the emperor in 1941, a restoration of the hospital took place too, to Adventist control. The medical staff were largely Scandinavian Adventist missionaries for the next 35 years until, after a revolution that overthrew Haile Selassie, the hospital was nationalized in 1976. That was this week in Adventist history. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We'd love to hear from you. Send us your feedback and tell us how your church is making a difference in its community. Be sure to capture plenty of video footage and photos, then write up a summary of the event's important details. And feel free to send full video reports as well. You can reach us by sending an email to annvideo11 at gmail.com. Before we say goodbye, here's some good news from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. And the passage says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love you. Amen. And that's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.